my name is Tim Peake and I'm an astronaut with the European Space Agency. And I'm here at the European Astronaut Centre in Cologne in Germany, which is where I work, along with my other European astronaut colleagues. And it's also where we do some of our training for missions on board the International Space Station. I'm delighted to have been invited by the Ask the Experts panel. Uh, and I've got a number of questions that have been sent in, so I'll start with David, who's 16 from Essex. And he asked that, having trained to be an astronaut, how did I feel about gravity and do I still like it? Well, that's a, a fun question and obviously we've all grown up with gravity and it's what we've known all of our lives. And throughout the Earth's history as well, over the billions of years, gravity has barely changed at all, whereas other parameters like temperature and pressure, they've changed quite a bit. So what's really exciting is to go into an area of weightlessness or microgravity as we call it on board the space station and we can do lots of interesting research there when we remove gravity. What I can say is I've spent, I've been privileged enough to spend just a few moments in weightlessness during parabolic flights as part of my training for going to the space station. And that's just a remarkable feeling. It really is very exhilarating, very natural, and it was very hard when myself and my colleagues first went into weightlessness on board this aircraft. Very hard not to sort of start smiling and laughing because it just feels like so much fun. The next question is from Katie Lou, who is 11 years old and from Kent, and she asked that, is it possible if there is life elsewhere in the universe, and could that be intelligent life? And I think that's a brilliant question, it's one that I get asked quite often, and I, I firmly believe that there is life elsewhere in the universe. In fact, I think there's life within our own solar system, and we certainly, I think we're quite close to finding traces of it on Mars, either past evidence of life or even present. And also, for example, some of the moons of the larger planets like Jupiter and Saturn have uh, ice and liquid water oceans beneath the icy crusts and there's a very good environment for possibly finding signs of life. As to intelligent life, well, that's a difficult question to answer and uh, I'm not sure at the moment that we're close to finding signs of intelligent life, but where, is there, where there are basic forms of life, then it's, uh, you know, it's natural to assume that that could easily develop throughout the passage of time into intelligent life forms. And the next question is from Phoebe, who's aged 12 from Chippenham, and she asked, how do you become an astronaut and is it ex as exciting as it sounds? Well, the great thing about becoming an astronaut is it doesn't really matter what background you come from. And people often ask, what do I have to do to become an astronaut? And just amongst the colleagues uh, within the European Astronaut Corps, we've got engineers, scientists, medical doctors, pilots, and throughout the, uh, the, the worldwide Astronaut Corps, if you like, uh, there's a plethora of different backgrounds from the various astronauts. So the great thing is, as long as you're passionate about what you do and interested in spaceflight, then there's a possibility of becoming an astronaut. All you have to do is pass the, the, the selection criteria, which admittedly can be quite tough at times. But yes, the job is definitely as exciting as it sounds. It's very different from one day to the next. Some of the training involves flight and aircraft, practicing weightlessness, lots of diving training, um, again, practicing weightlessness for spacewalking, and a multitude of other different tasks that you have to learn, but it's all great fun. A great question from Prashika, who's 14 from London, who asked, what would be a, the most amazing space mission that I could be involved in, or might go on, and why? Well, I would love to answer a mission, a manned mission to Mars, but realistically I do think that the, the manned mission to Mars, which will happen at some point, is probably just beyond my career time frame, although hopefully within my lifetime. But a mission that I might be able to go on, which would be absolutely incredible, would be a manned mission to explore an asteroid. And this is something that I trained for last year in Florida with NASA on their, with their NASA's Extreme Environments Mission Operations. And we spent 12 days living underneath the ocean, practicing what sort of tools, techniques and procedures we're going to need in order to explore an asteroid. So I very much think that that will be a, a fantastic and very exciting and interesting mission to go on. There's a question from Tommy, age 12, and he asks, how did people know that it would be safe to fly to the moon and back? And that's a really good question because that addresses spaceflight and safety. And really, humans, we have to explore the limits. And when we do that, we have to take risks. But we take risks in a sort of calculated way. And it's something I've been used to all my life uh, in my former role as a test pilot. We used to have to explore the boundaries and the limits of aircraft. But before we went on any flight, we would sit down and we would spend a lot of time analyzing all the risks and making sure that everything was safe. 
But in order to pro progress, you do have to take and accept some form of risk. And certainly during the Apollo missions, there was risk involved with those moon landings. Uh, and in fact, one of the big risks was from a solar flare. And just by chance, the astronauts did miss by several days. They missed a large solar flare, which would have been very dangerous to the health of the astronauts on that mission. So there are risks involved today in spaceflight, and there will be throughout the future. But I think it's important that we get that balance right so that we don't actually stop progressing, and that we don't stop exploring throughout fear of taking on too much risk. And the final question is from Nicholas, who's aged 13 and from Kent, and asks, what is the furthest that we're going to travel in the next 100 years in space? And that's an excellent question, and it's one that I really don't have the answer to. I'll leave it up to everybody to imagine where we might be in 100 years. But if you think back to where we have come in the last 100 years, just in terms of aviation and flight alone, we've really uh, seen the, the birth of aviation followed all the way through to the moon landings, to now where we have a permanent habitat in low Earth, low Earth orbit. And in the next 100 years, we are definitely going to move away, well away from low Earth orbit, and I think we're going to set up uh, habitation modules on other planets and on other moons, hopefully our own moon and on Mars and beyond. Um, we've got some major technological problems to overcome in terms of space travel and trying to cut down the time it takes to travel to other planets. And also things uh, that affect health like radiation shielding during the journeys to other planets. But once we tackle those problems, really the solar system is ours to explore. And in 100 years, who's to say that we're not living or visiting some of the moons of Jupiter as well as the outer planets? Who knows? Thank you very much to, to all of you for your questions. There's lots more, but unfortunately we've only got time for a few. Uh, please continue your interest in space and continue thinking about these wonderful ideas and how we can use space to the advantage of ourselves here back on Earth.